There are a lot of different treatments for multiple sclerosis. We have drugs, diets, alternative and complementary practices, but today we're going to take a look at some of the strangest and most unusual treatments of multiple sclerosis and the history and evidence behind them, and one of them, perhaps the weirdest, craziest, least desirable treatment, is actually proven in a class 1 randomized controlled trial. Let's have some fun. This video is inspired by an article written by Stephen Barrett at Quackwatch, so I'll go ahead and include a link to his article about multiple sclerosis in the comments below, along with several other references related to these treatments. And by the way, I'm not trying to be dismissive or derogatory towards unusual or counterintuitive ideas, and as you'll see, sometimes strange treatments can be effective. By the way, I'm Brandon Bieber, and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications, and if you enjoy this video, please click like. The first treatment I want to talk about is bee sting therapy. This is where you intentionally allow yourself to be stung by hundreds of bees. And you may be asking, how exactly would that help with multiple sclerosis? But there is actually a theoretical principle at play here. It turns out that inflammation in multiple sclerosis can largely be shown to be related to a T helper cell type 1 response. In other words, a certain subclass of CD4 positive T cells are related to inflammation in multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis. And when you're stung by a bee, it actually shifts your immune cells to more of a T helper cell type 2 profile, very similar to the mechanism of action of beta interferons. However, it was studied in a randomized controlled trial and was completely ineffective. Along the same lines, snake and scorpion venom has been used for multiple sclerosis, and there are some incredible anecdotal reports, but it's never been studied formally, so we just don't know if it works or not. The next treatment is extremely popular and people do it all the time and sometimes report incredible results, which is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The idea is that MS could be related to low oxygen perfusion of affected tissues, perhaps not so crazy. The idea of a hyperbaric oxygen chamber is it has high levels of partial pressure of oxygen, much higher than atmospheric pressure that hyperoxygenate the blood and potentially deliver more oxygen to tissues and you go into the chamber for a brief period of time but do it repeatedly over time and this was famously done by Marlo Donate Parmalee in her well-known book about multiple sclerosis and she reported excellent results however there are many clinical trials and they're inconclusive and Cochrane's evidence-based reviews suggest that there's inconclusive evidence and no definitive evidence for hyperbaric oxygen therapy in multiple sclerosis Another possible treatment for MS is antifungal agents such as Nystatin often used chronically to clear out chronic fungal or yeast overgrowth in the gastrointestinal tract. This is promoted by Anne Baroque in the book Healing Multiple Sclerosis. And I did a review of this book before if you want to take a look by clicking the card above. Now the idea here definitely has an element of truth. We think that because of high intake of processed sugar and because of the use of antibiotics which may disturb normal gastrointestinal flora, you can get this phenomenon of yeast overgrowth which can disturb the gastrointestinal tract and possibly cause leaky gut antigens, exposing your immune system to foreign antigens. So there may be an element of truth here, although the use of potentially toxic antifungal agents such as Nystatin, which can sometimes cause liver problems over a long period of time, really unproven in MS at this time. Now while some believe yeast causes multiple sclerosis, others believe it could treat MS. And there's a product called Proper Mill, which is an intravenous yeast formulation containing lyophilized yeast. And there was Professor Gastaldi of the Clinic of Mental and Nervous Diseases from Milan University who published a case series of 20 individuals in 1961 receiving many doses of intravenous yeast. We're talking about 100 treatments or 200 treatments and he described these incredible remissions, but it was never studied in a proper randomized control trial. Now this next one is really, really unusual, which is DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Now you may be thinking, where have I heard that before? Perhaps you heard it from an old organic chemistry class because it's a well-known organic solvent and it's actually used in medicine. It has this property where it penetrates cell membranes really well so it can be used to deliver topical anesthetics or anti-inflammatory agents and things like that, like in topical creams. But it's thought to have these anti-inflammatory properties, reducing cellular edema or possibly having some kind of remyelinating effect. But anyways, it was used as a treatment in MS in Russia and there's a case series in 1984 
suggesting it could be beneficial in relapsing MS, but ineffective in progressing MS. Anyways, I can't find any recent data on DMSO in multiple sclerosis. Another interesting treatment that's been tried is magnet therapy for MS. Now, it's interesting that magnetic fields have known effects on the nervous system, and transcranial magnetic stimulation may be beneficial in depression and other neurological diseases, for instance, is there actually very good evidence for this. However, in 1992, there was a case report in a 50-year-old woman with progressive multiple sclerosis who was exposed to magnet therapy and reported to have this amazing reversal of disability. The problem is it was a very strange case. They used very low strength magnetic fields. We're talking Pico Tesla magnetic fields. So basically the equivalent of a magnet you could buy at the hardware store and just put against your scalp. And also the same woman had a massive worsening of her symptoms when she got the drug melatonin, the sleeping supplement, which is a little bit unusual. I'm not sure what to make about this case, but I can't find any definitive evidence that magnet therapy is beneficial in MS. Now, if we go back in time, back to before we had FDA-approved drugs for MS, believe it or not, surgical treatments for MS, sort of experimental, weird surgical treatments for MS were popular. And one of these was thymectomy, or surgical removal of the thymus, which is a lymphoid gland which actually disintegrates as you get older, but small remnants can be present in adults. And removal of the thymus is actually used for treatment of another autoimmune disease of the nervous system, which is myasthenia gravis, where antibodies attack the neuromuscular junction. And it turns out the thymus is involved in T-cell maturation, so removing it sort of modulates the immune system. And there was actually a case series of 35 people with MS published in 1983 in a cardiothoracic surgery journal, suggesting that some people improve over over a two-year period, but it was never really studied in a randomized trial. Another surgery that's been attempted is vertebral artery surgery by a guy named Alan Hurwitz in the 1970s. Now you have four arteries that go into your brain. You have the two carotid arteries in the front where you can feel your pulse, and then you have two arteries in the back known as vertebral arteries that sort of go to your brainstem and cerebellum. And this guy, Dr. Hurwitz, did a case series on nine individuals with MS where he sort of surgically opened up the vertebral arteries to restore blood flow to the brain and reported that they improved. The the problem is it's a very strange and counterintuitive idea because, for one, none of the spinal cord or optic nerves are fed by the vertebral arteries, and most of the brain is not fed by the vertebral arteries. Also, we know that people actually have vertebral basilar disease, but they don't get multiple sclerosis. They're at risk of stroke, for instance. So it's a very weird and counterintuitive idea and obviously has fallen out of favor for many decades. Yet another surgery that has been performed for MS is a sympathectomy. The sympathetic chain is this cluster of nerves in the upper chest that controls part of the autonomic nervous system. And there was a case series published in JAMA in 1934 of five people showing a, quote, remarkable alleviation of symptoms. This is a very controversial procedure, very unusual that it would be used for multiple sclerosis, which doesn't even really affect the peripheral nervous system. Not exactly sure what happened with those individuals, but... Regardless, this has fallen out of favor many decades ago. And now we have come to it. What is the one strange treatment that is actually proven in a class one trial? Believe it or not, it is intentional ingestion of parasites, of parasitic hookworms. Now I'll give a little background here. There's this thought that diseases such as MS and other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus may be more common in developed countries because of what we call the hygiene hypothesis. And what that is is that we think because we wear shoes and we protect ourselves from parasites, we don't walk around barefoot, we don't drink contaminated water, we don't get parasite infections when we're young, and that has an effect of sort of messing up and dysregulating regulating our immune system. And it turns out when your immune system responds to parasites, it generates a T helper cell type 2 response, just like I talked about in response to bee stings and the mechanism of action of beta interferons used to treat MS. Also, it causes an eosinophilic response. Both of these are counter to the T helper cell type 1 response associated with multiple sclerosis. So the idea is that if you're infected with parasites, you may be less likely to develop autoimmune diseases such as MS because our immune system is sort of used to dealing with parasites and it doesn't know what to do when it doesn't see them. Anyways, there's a special hookworm called Necator americanus, which apparently cannot replicate within the human body. So it's not dangerous for humans to ingest small amounts of this. 
caviar M. Tour, I would say. But anyways, there was a randomized trial of 66 individuals with MS published in JAMA showing that those who received the treatment, treatment hookworm injection compared to placebo had 50% fewer relapses. Now I want to know, has anyone tried any of these treatments? Are there other unusual treatments you've tried or have heard about? And do you have any other suggestions for future videos? Please post in the comments below.